Hi, everyone. Welcome to our naturalist training. Uh, we have Michael Fox here. He lived in North Texas all his life, and he spent much of his uh, youth in Fannin County. He started photographing nature in 2011 at Leela, which is Lake Louisville, or Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Area, located right in the heart of Louisville, Texas. He was drawn to dragonflies and dam damselflies through iNaturalist, and he has since photo documented over 80 species of odonates, and most of them have been at Leela, and he has a book to prove it. Um, when he can break away from iNaturalist and dragonflies, he manages to find a time earning a living in the global IT market. Um, Michael has taught several iNaturalist training classes, mostly at the Louisville Library, and this is where I met Michael. He introduced me to the wild world of iNaturalist before it even became an, a project of the Elmport chapter. So welcome, Michael, and I'll turn it over to you. Good afternoon. Yeah, and I remember that day, Mary, <laughs> very well. Those were fun. Uh, we need, I'm anxious that they get the library fully open again so we can do some more of that there. So anyway, uh, yeah, uh, I assume most of you here today have some familiarity with uh, iNaturalist, you know, have set up an account or, uh, you know, ha have used it somewhat. Uh, one of the things that I want to uh, talk about briefly uh, as we begin here is, is iNaturalist has really exploded as far as the number of users with the introduction of their uh, phone app. And a lot of people uh, use that phone app because that's the best, you know, uh, camera they've got. And it's just really easy to use, snap a picture with your camera or your phone, just like you do your kids or whatever, but you're out in the field, it may be a flower, it may be a bug. And then it's just very, very easy to have that loaded to iNAT. Uh, that's the way I look at it. That's a big part of iNaturalist is capturing and uploading those observations. But the real fun comes, I think, or, or maybe not the real, but just as much fun comes in, in looking deeply at the data uh, that we capture with those photographs and those recordings of sounds uh, and things. And I'm not sure if you folks are aware, but uh, just this week, uh, they added the feature in the phone app to where now you can capture sound. Like say you're out on a trail and you hear a beautiful bird singing, you can record that bird song and load it to INAT and it will attempt to identify that bird just based on the sound. So very exciting. Uh, that opens up a whole new world uh, to be able to do that easily, just like taking a picture, you can record the sound and upload it. But today is an advanced course. We're really gonna speak more to the desktop version, uh, which would be on a laptop or a desktop type computer. Uh, and some uh, tablets. Uh, I definitely stay away from the app. Uh, the app is still very phone based. Uh, but if we go to the iNaturalist website, which we see here, I'm sharing. Uh, can everyone see that? Mary, you see that okay? Okay. Anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and log in. If you've not ever been in iNat, you just have to create some kind of a username and a password. Uh, very safe website. They don't share your information. They don't spam you with, you know, advertisements from other, you know, people. Uh, very, very safe. Uh, just a way to identify who's, who's who when we're tagging things or uploading observations. So uh, this is my page or, or what it comes up to for me. It shows, you know, a variety of of uh, different observations that, that are very recent. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm gonna go into my observations. Uh, I'm not sure if you folks in setting up your, uh, your profile, one of the things that you can do as far as, you know, not only writing a little bit about yourself, maybe what your favorite tax taxa are or, you know, what you love about INAT or what, you know, your profession might be. 
Uh, there is also a way where you can set your default favorite place. And of course, my favorite place is Leela. Uh, I live so close by and it's so huge and it's just still an adventure every time I go out. So you can actually set, you know, a particular place or location as your favorite. So when you go in and say, for instance, here, I'm gonna click on your observations, which would be mine. It automatically defaults to Leela. Now it says the world over here. Uh, oh, wait a minute, it's not Leela. This one, it, okay, yeah, this just shows my observations. So I'll step back from that a bit. Uh, it comes up with my observations, but if I want to look at say Leela or say, uh, uh, Clear Creek, uh, Natural Heritage Area. Uh, if I want to look at one of those, one of the neat ways, and this just narrows down the data set that you want to look at. Uh, so for instance, I'm very interested a lot of times in the different, uh, the different species or taxonomies uh, at Leela. Uh, so we can create, say, those checklists and things like that, things that have actually been observed there. So one of the things I always go into is community. And under community, you have people. You could look up a specific person or people. Uh, projects, though, this is really the cool one because I can imagine you as master naturalist in, in the Denton County area, uh, you may have a project ongoing at, say, Clear Creek or one of the other uh, where we're doing those bio blitzes, as, as Mary and I were talking about earlier. Uh, we can define the geographical bounds of those places and they become places in INAT. So then you can go look at just observations within those geographical boundaries. Uh, so that's one of the things I'll do uh, during the City Nature Challenge. I'll not only be looking at the DFW area, which is includes many counties, uh, you know, it's a pretty good sized area, but I'll also be focusing on Leela, you know, saying, Ooh, what did we see at Leela, you know, during the bio blitz, you know, making sure uh, the counts are right or, you know, looking for, for cool data, like how many dragonflies did they see this year? It's a little early for dragonflies, so we usually don't see quite as many during bio blitz time as we do, say, a month or two down the road, uh, then you're at your peak dragonfly time. But what I'm going to show you today is how to do that, okay? Now, I'm going to go to Clear Creek. Uh, heritage uh, area because it is a smaller data set and it just makes what I'm going to do here for you today, it makes it, it, it's quicker responding. It's not having to search through that monstrous amount of observations that we have at Leela because we've been doing it for, you know, over 10 years now. Uh, but if we go to Clear Creek, it's a much smaller data set. So when I do a filter here, you're going to see it returns back pretty quickly. Sometimes within Leela, since we're at like 60,000 uh, observations, you know, I may say, okay, you know, show me this data set. And it may take four or five minutes. And then on some days it might take 30 minutes. Uh, so there's a feature you can say, well, just finish it and send me an email with that data instead of me having to sit here and wait. Anyway, so I'm inside the, uh, the projects uh, lookup page. And I'm going to type in Clear Creek. Let's see if it comes up with this. I'm going to say Clear Creek. Is it going to come up for me? I always have a, it's Clear Creek Natural Heritage. Is that? The, let's see. That's correct. Natural Heritage. Okay. There it is, here we go, I got close. So I wanna click on this one and notice they have two. The other one, the bottom one is a newer one and it's what we call a, uh, a uh, oh, I forget what they call that. Uh, but anyway, it just, anything anybody posts within those boundaries automatically is in the project. It's like, it takes no a interaction. Yeah, a collection, exactly. So I really like these collections. We've got one for the city of Louisville. We've got one for Leela. And this is really cool here, this one uh, for Clear Creek. So here are our observations uh, at Clear Creek. 
and a little statistics, 6,317 different observations, 1,100 species, uh, so on and so forth. One of the things I'm going to do, because today I want to say extract some specific data uh, from all these observations, you know, you don't want to scroll through page after page after page, you know, writing down or copying observation by observation, uh, just to find out like uh, how many amphibian species have, have been identified. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to click over here on the right where it says view all. Instead of recent observations, it's going to show me all the observations and notice at the top we're at 6,317. Now, one of the things I can do, and this is cool, but that's a lot of data. That's a lot of stuff to search through and it's not in any specific order. Uh, it's really cool just to browse on a daily basis, see what somebody might have put in new since the last time you looked. But if you're really doing research, like I go into species, and so you see one photograph or one observation from each species that has been identified at Clear Creek. And so it makes it a little easier, but it's still 1100 different species that I would be searching through to find, you know, what I may be wanting. So up here at the top, we can actually type in here species. So say for instance, uh, you know, I'm real crazy about dragonflies. So I'm going to type in dragon or dragonflies. And we get just dragonflies. And boy, there's some cool ones I got. I love those blue faced meadowhawks. So we have 232 different observations, and that includes 28 species, which that sounds about right for the area. Uh, Leela is a little bit more varied type uh, uh, ecosystems. You know, we have the big prairie, we have the hardwood bottoms, we have uh, you know, we have a, a variety of, of ecosystems uh, there at Leela, so we tend to have a little bit wider variety of dragonflies, whereas Clear Creek, I think, is, is a lot of heavy woods, uh, and there's a lot of wet to it, uh, so it's a nice mix, but uh, probably not quite as diverse as what uh, you, you might find at Leela. Anyway, uh, so what we've done here, uh, these are all the dragonfly uh, species, 28, and I can skim through those and, you know, it tells me how many of each observation, uh, you know, have been seen. So well, there's been two red saddlebags photographed there. Ooh, what's this one down here? This looks like the Texas Master Natural. Cyrano Darner. Doesn't that look an awful lot like uh, the uh, Texas Master Naturalist dragonfly? Anyway. So that's one way we can, you know, type in specific species uh, and just see those. Then we can see all the observations. Uh, one of the reasons I do it like this, as far as species, like there's thir 36 different pictures of Eastern pond hawks. So I can look at just pond hawk pictures, you know, and that helps me if I'm trying to identify a photograph that I have that I don't know what it is. I might just go in here and look at, you know, all these different pictures of this particular Eastern pond hawk and, you know, at all different angles, things like that. Uh, we can get even more deep into this. Uh, there's a filter section over here on the upper right. And if we click on our filter section, it brings up a much more detailed, let me see if I uh, a lot of more uh, ways to filter down this data. Each, each observation has a lot of different fields with a lot of different info. And we can use these searches and filtering uh, to what I call data mining. It's, sim it's a simple form of data mining. But what we see here is uh, I can filter out these dragonflies by just which ones are wild observations or show me if there are any observations here of captive dragonflies, which you probably won't see. They're, they're almost impossible to raise in captivity. This would mean like raised in captivity, like in a cage or an aquarium or something, uh, not so much as I caught it with a 
uh, bug net and I'm holding it here to get a good picture, but then I release it, that would still be considered a wild specimen. Uh, but we can go through here and we can select or narrow down what we're looking at. Uh, like I only want to see research grade and research grade means that at least two or more uh, members or people in iNaturalist have confirmed or agree on the identification. Uh, that makes it research. If I put something up there and I'm the only one that's, you know, done anything with that, it's called, uh, it's not research grade, it's called needs an ID. Uh, then once Mary Morrow comes in and goes, sure, Mike, that's a, you know, whatever, uh, she agrees, then we have two agreements and then it becomes research grade quality. So we can narrow it down by these different, uh, different things. Uh, we can also narrow it down by a person. Like say, for instance, I know uh, uh, Denver Kramer takes a huge amount of photographs out at Leela now. Uh, he is our top observer at Leela, spends lots of time volunteering. So he's always carrying that camera around, kind of like what Larry, uh, Larry Brennan used to do and, and what I still do to some degree. Uh, but anyway, I could actually put in a username here like MCHLFX, which is my handle in INAT, or I could put in Abigail's uh, ID, and it would only show me, when I run this filter, it would only show me Abigail's photographs and based on these other filters that we may set here. Notice down here, it's using a project, which is the Clear Creek Natural Heritage Center. Okay, so we can we can filter out uh, observations based on projects, which I, I like to use projects because typically by the time someone set one up, they've really worked on getting a good geographical boundary uh, of that location. Uh, when you start talking about statewide, like I have a statewide cicada uh, project in here, the state of Texas is well defined too. So I didn't, I didn't have to use a project, I just used down here below this place. And I just put in Texas and bam, you know, it, it only shows me a data set of observations within the boundaries of the state of Texas. So that's a handy one there, either project or place. Uh, let's see here. Oh, let me go back to that filters again. Now categories, this, I use this quite a bit, uh, checking on Leela's uh, checklists and we need to update those. We've noticed that we've let, let them get fairly out of, out of date. A lot of new species have been added since those were last updated. But categories here, and these are just little symbolic uh, pictures of different categories of uh, wildlife. We have birds, a little picture of a bird. We have amphibians. We have reptiles, we have mammals, fishes, ray finned fishes, uh, mollusks, spiders, arachnids, and we have insects, plants, fungi, and protozoans. And believe it or not, we do have a few protozoan <laughs> observations. Uh, uh, we've had some of the UNT folks out there looking at water under uh, their field microscopes. And, and so we've got some protozoa uh, photographs. And then we have unknown. So uh, you just click on one of those. So like if, if I'm in the filter, setting up a new filter, I could click on the bird and it would show me birds at Clear Creek Natural Heritage Area. Okay. Or I could say, show me birds at and amphibians. I don't know why I would want to do that, but I could pick out either one of these and we could see uh, those particular uh, uh, taxa. I'm not really as familiar with this rank high to low. Uh, it's, uh, I, I apologize <laughs> for not knowing that. Uh, but the sort by, it, it, I usually leave that by date added. So whenever my data comes out and we're going to export it out into a file that I can use uh, more easily, 
uh, all these observations will be in date order, starting with the oldest date down to the newest date. So, uh, so that's a, just a sort order, and you can do like date added, date observed, or favorites. I typically do date observed. Now, photo licensing. I don't use this very much because I don't, you know, I don't use pictures from my aunt. Uh, you know, for other projects and things. I just don't, I use my own photographs. So I don't have to worry about license. Uh, and by the way, my, my uh, photographs are all set up with the default license in iNaturalist, which lets anybody use them for, you know, teaching or, or learning experience. You just can't use them to make money off of them. You couldn't take my picture and put it in a book that you're gonna be selling. Uh, but if you're a teacher in a high school or you're, uh, you know, somebody that's putting together, you know, something that's non-monetary is certainly free to use it. Uh, so uh, just letting you guys know if you ever need that for any kind of a presentation, feel free to use any of my photographs. Uh, anyway, reviewed, uh, I put, always leave that any, but the reviewed button here means that someone has looked at it and said yes or no. That's your guess is correct. Uh, I always just leave it as any. Uh, date observed. Uh, now this is really cool. Uh, for the city nature challenge, you know, that's a specific date range that, that we're going to be doing it. You only have like four days to take observations and then you only have so many days later to actually, you know, get the IDs all caught up. But there's you know, that hard range of, of date. And so what I do after, or even sometimes during the, uh, during the uh, City Nature Challenge, instead of, leave, you know, filtering for any date of an observation, I will go in and say a range, okay? And that range I can put in here, just for instance, I'm gonna say April 1st for the start, and I'm gonna say April, let's see here, I need to move this screen here, 16th, which is today. So right now I've said, you know, show me these observations of say, for instance, birds at Clear Creek. And I only wanna see the ones that were put in this month or observed this month, okay? So I've narrowed down my scope. So on the City Nature Challenge, you could put the starting date for the challenge and the ending date for the challenge. And then when you do a filter, you can see exactly how many, you know, how many observations were done in that comp competition area or during the, the City Nature Challenge bio blitz. You, you can see that finite number. And if you're using that with a project or a place, you could even use Denton County. If you wanted to get the number, how many people you know, did an observation during the City Nature Challenge just in Denton, okay? Or you could say DFW and get, get that. But this is a way we narrow things down and it's fun to see. Uh, I know the first year we did this, it was just amazing. Leela over doubled her number of observations just during the City Nature Challenge. I mean, that's how many people got out there and did it and that we went from, you know, X amount to twice that amount uh, of total observation. So really kind of fun to do this. And that's why I like this filtering. You can do it for specific months or date ranges or exact dates. Like say, if you guys had, uh, what do they call that? The, the, uh, uh, the big set where they do the, you know, they had the competition, see how many birds you can see from sitting in the same spot on a specific day, you can go in here and put this exact date in there and it would only show you things from that day. And in that case, it would be birds on that day. And you could see whether it was a huge jump or whether there was any change, uh, just kind of fun data to see. <clears throat> and then date added, these are dates observed and date added. Now I typically, use date observed because that's more scientific. You know, I, like I, a lot of times I want to see when we see our first particular species of dragonfly and I want to see over a period of time how those observations increase or decrease, you know, and that tells me the season. Uh, 
So I typically work with date observed when you saw it, because a lot of times you won't get it in until the next day or the next day, or maybe a week later, you get a chance to sit down and actually add those into INET. So anyway, we've, we've set some filters here. Uh, there again, these are fairly self-explanatory. If anybody has questions about them after this, I'm always available via email or uh, Facebook chat. I love to help people with, with this tool, but there's a variety of ways to, to narrow down to find specific numbers or counts or you know, dates uh, in regards to specific species. So one of the things I can do here is I can say update search and that's going to change the background here when I do this. And I don't guess it found anything. No birds were taken during the month of April at uh, Clear Creek. Okay, weather had been that great. Uh, let me do this. Let me change this one. And let's do this one to Louisville. And let's do this on Louisville, Texas, since we're talking about City Nature Challenge. This would show me all the observations within Louisville. Okay, I'm gonna take off the category there. So it's gonna show me all the different uh, taxa from Louisville just during the month of April. Okay, and, and for City Nature Challenge, we would just make those dates match the start and end of the uh, City Nature Challenge. And so when I would say update filter, we've got 80 different observations have been entered in the month of April in the city limits of Louisville, Texas. And you can see Denver Kramer has a huge amount there. Okay. So I hope to have a huge amount when I get to retire finally. Uh, but anyway, so there we can just see stuff in April. Okay, let's go back to our filters. Now, this is one that Abigail uh, had asked a question about this uh, prior to the today's presentation of how do I uh, print out or create just a life list, you know, no pictures, just a, you know, worded list. What I will do here is I'm going to take off the project, no place. I'm going to put my name in Abigail. In this case, you would put your name, your handle inside iNaturalist. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm going to use mine, which is Michael Fox. I'm going to take off that date range. So it's going to be anything that Michael Fox takes on any date. Okay, yeah, here we go. Let me put that back in, Michael. M-I-C-H-A-L-F-X. Okay, and I want any of those, any date added, any date observed. And here's what we will do. Update the search. 1,168 observations. Now, wait a minute. Oh, this is dragonflies. I'm going to take off the dragonfly species. Go back to filters so it's not just dragonflies. It's Michael Fox, any place on earth, any date. And I want to see those. So we do an update search. Okay, so that's now 6,050. So that's my total number of observations. But what I want to do is I want to go to species. This would be my life list, okay? So I have 846 different species I've seen since I've you know, been putting things into INAT. Now I'm gonna go back over here to filters. And one of the things I can say is, wait a minute, identify, research, update, search, reset, search. Hmm. Let me go back to lists. Let's go back into filters. Download. 
And so now we're going to export our observations. Okay, let me back up and do that again. That probably was confusing. Let's uh, do an escape. Let's just start that over again. I'm going to go to my observations. I'm going to do species. And then we're going to go into filters. So I've got my species selected. And I'm going to do a download. And now it comes up with what, you know, the specifics on that download. There's a lot of fields in here. So I try to minimize it and use only, you know, what I, I need or am looking for in my download. So there's the username is Michael Fox. And Abigail, you would put your handle in there any day of the month or year you know no specific project or places or specific taxons uh just leave every so you know really really we're just looking for abigail or michael's uh, observations it shows you a little preview you can scroll up or down through here looking you know make sure it's including all the stuff you want now, this is what data do you want to pull? The ID is a, just a number. Uh, each observation in INET has a unique number. So I turn that off. It doesn't make any, it's not important to me. I don't care about the on, observed on string, but I do care about the observed on. This is the date that that observation was actually made. And that's always important. It helps you sort out, shows you when you saw it, uh, helps you see a season better. Uh, I don't care so much about what time it was observed, but you could leave the time it was observed in there. So you'd get the date and time that that, that species was seen. Time zone is usually not that important. Most of us take pictures or do our observations within our own say our own backyard <laughs> or time zone. So I'll take that off and I don't like user ID. I do like the user log on that shows me the name of the person uh, and then created at is not very important. Updated like when somebody last made a change to your observation page like agreed with it or disagreed with it. I don't care about that. I'm not really crazy about the quality or grade uh and or license or the url for that in other words i'm really just wanting to get the species name and what day it was was uh observed and, and it was who, who it was observed by in this case will always be me since i set that filter image url uh, that just you know a link to the picture sound tags i just turn all this stuff off even description um, and there again, these, these are fairly self explanatory, uh, like in other words, if you had this checked here for image URL in the data that's output, it would have a link that you could just click on that link and it would go right to the picture in INAT. Okay. Uh, but in this case, we're doing a life list. We're really just looking at the date and what the species is. Okay. For. Michael Fox or yourself. Now place, uh, I don't like guess, like I might have guessed it was, you know, and it may not be absolutely correct. I don't like latitude, longitude. That's not very important to me because I'm not, you know, I mean, that's on the INAT map. Uh, don't care about that, whether it's private. Let's just turn these things off. These are just, you know, more coordinates, geo coordinates, and geo privacy positioning device. Okay. Now, taxon. This is the this is the important part of your life list. What did you see? You know, what what different species have you seen in your lifetime? So I'm not going to go with species guess. Like I might have thought it was a, uh, a four striped leaf tail. 
and somebody else finally corrected me and said it's a five striped leaf tail. Okay, uh, so the guess doesn't matter because it wasn't right. Uh, I do like the scientific name and the common name. Okay, uh, then the iconic, I, that's really not important and the taxon ID is not as important. Uh, the taxon extras, uh, this is if you're really into the zoology of it all. Uh, these are all like the, you know, subtribe and tribe names and, you know, subspecies. Uh, I really stick to just species in, in my data, but if you're really, you know, like if you're working on a master's up at UNT, some of this stuff would possibly be quite important to your uh, data mining. Uh, observation fields, these are things like, you know, what the temperature was or, you know, things like that. Not very important to me, especially on a life list. Uh, so observation fields, probably not important when you're talking about uh, doing a life list or, or your most common or simple type data uh, extractions. So it does show you your previous extractions like uh, last night, this morning, I did a couple of extractions just practicing here uh, and I can reopen those. I can download those again if I need to, but eventually they do clear this out. But here's what I'm gonna click on is create the export. So there again, Ab Abigail will run through this. I want any date, so I don't change anything up here. I just make sure it has my name up here and then down here in the bottom, I just have the date I observed it and the login name, which is my handle on INAT. And it's gonna have the scientific and the common names. Okay, that's all it's gonna output for me. Very straightforward, very nice little uh, 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 life list. So I'm gonna say create export. So it starts working with that. And notice how it says lading loading, uh, I can either check back later or I can say, send me an email with that data I just, you know, said to filter out on. Now this may take a little while because I think I have more observations than, uh, or have quite a few observations. But uh, we'll uh, take any questions while this is coming along. Once this downloads, uh, which might take a few more minutes, uh, we'll open it up and I'll show you what it actually produced as far as data. Now it downloads it in what's called a comma delimited file, uh, but it, it those will open up in Microsoft Excel. Uh, I think they'll also open up easily within Google's little spreadsheet, free spreadsheet program. So uh, if you have any issues with the uh, getting a free spreadsheet program to look at this data, just let me know and I'll help you find something there. But I think a lot of people have Microsoft Excel. So now it's finished that export, okay? It's, we did the filter. We said, I wanna see all the observations Mike Fox has ever done. I wanna see the date and time and I wanna see the common and scientific names. So it has produced that, it's downloaded it to my computer. So now I'm gonna click on this button and it's gonna start downloading. And then depending on your antivirus software, it may scan it to make sure it's okay and no problems with it. But then once it's downloaded, I can just click on this and it opens up the file. Okay, and I'm gonna open up the observations. And here is our data list. Now I'm going to, so it starts out in 2013, 2012. It's not sorted in any order. Now, Mike, we're not seeing that since you were sharing. Oh, your that's right. Good catch. Hang on just a minute. Let me new share. And let's go to this spreadsheet. Let yeah. me know. Got it now. Okay, good deal. Thanks for catching that. Uh, so we've got our data here and it's not in any particular date order, but here you see, this is the date I saw it, I'll say on August 13th, 2013. Let me blow this up a little bit. I think I can do that. Let's see. Okay. Anyway, on August 13th, there's a zoom slider at the bottom right. 
on the bottom right. Yeah, that zero to hundred percent. Of the spreadsheet. Yeah. So if you just slide that slider. Yep, 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 yep. There we go. Yeah. You can see that much better. Mm -hmm. So there again, August 13th, 2013, I saw a uh, white-tailed deer. Scientific name. Now we could go in and in Excel, we can sort by these dates. So it would show you my oldest and it would go down the, down the dates to my most, my newest uh, observation. Uh, so that's just a matter of, of, you know, whatever spreadsheet you're using, uh, being able to do the sort orders and, and things like that. Uh, now what this does, this is actually the entire, uh, this is all my observations, not just, just a list of what I've seen. So there could be multiple white-tailed deer in here. So what I do here is I go into the data and I'm going to do a uh, filter. And under filter, oh, excuse me, we're gonna do a sort excuse me there, yeah, so we're, we're gonna do the on common name. So it take a little bit of manipulation here, but I have uh, like under American alligator, you know, I got quite a few of those. You can just, you know, count that as one or remove these or even do what's called a pivot table. So it only shows one American alligator and then you could pivot to show all the different American alligators you see. Uh, but this takes a little bit of manipulation. Uh, I like these data sets like this because I can go through. Now, these are all for me, but typically at Leela, I pull in, you know, all the observations at Leela, not based on user. And then I can see maybe who the top, who the top observer was for a particular month or who the top observer is for a particular species over here, uh, you know, and that helps me, uh, you know, kind of give accolades or, or, you know, things like that to people or know who my experts are on different things. Uh, like say, you know, who takes the most pictures of, of birds or who's taking the most raptor pictures. Uh, so the, there again, this is just a very basic data set. Uh, and it can be, let's see here. I, I'm sorry, I, I meant to have a pivot table. I'm not as good at pivot tables, uh, but there is a way. And if anybody needs help with that afterwards, you know, you can certainly shoot me a message or, or things and, and I, we can work together on doing a pivot table where it is more of a clean, just a list of species, not all the uh, details of every species. So that's kind of the step there. Uh, one of the ways that I have used this, let's go here, let's go back to another screen share. Let's go into naturalist. The other way that I use the data mining uh, like I said, we do uh, the checklist at Leela. Say for instance, let me go into this, let's go into explore. Now when I go into explore, it automatically goes to Leela, Louisville Lake. Uh, but the way I do their, their uh, uh, checklist is I go in and I just pick out uh, say birds, for instance, okay? And it will show me all the birds, but then I say species. So right now I've got 226 different species of bird have been identified at Leela. And so then I can do this into a list and I can export this thing, uh, just like we did that, uh, just did a few minutes ago. And it, we, uh, here we go, filters. And we can do uh, download that. And so this should give us, you know, all those species, just the species. 
So that's how I create a list. And then I compare it to what we have on our website and I will add any that are not, that are not on the website that are here in our group. So I can also do that again. I can go back in here. Let's back that up some. Let's do another species in filters. Instead of birds, we want to do uh, amphibians. And we will do update search. And we only have eight species of amphibians, OK? Yeah. Which is about normal. That's about normal. I mean, you, there's not quite as many different amphibians especially in non-tropical or wetter environments uh, than what we have here. So that's so, pretty cool. Excuse me, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so Abigail didn't see how you, um, ah. let me get her. Sure. She didn't say how you got from the filter page to the export page. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that one more time. Let's go in here. So I'm going to do, like say, we'll play with this smaller data set. Okay, so we just got eight species of frogs at Leela. How do I get this printed out or get this into the spreadsheet? What I do is right up here on the upper right-hand side, there's this filters button. Okay, so under filters, I click on that. It already has my amphibians selected. It's got all the you know search stuff, but what I click on here is this download button. So when I say download it, it comes up with the you know additional, all the stuff I want to export it from that. And there again, if you leave all these checked, you're going to get a huge spreadsheet, and it may take a while. But really, what I want to do is just none, and I want to say user log in and I want to say the observed on date and then I don't really want to any of it we know it's all going to be at Leela because I already selected Leela and tax and I just want scientific and common names and this is all under the filter button okay and once I get those you know narrowed down on the filter I say create the export. This one should happen pretty quick because it's, well, I don't know. It may have to go through all that 60,000. So it may take a minute. But there again, on our page, once we narrowed that field down, we went into the filters button in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. We went through that little detail, picking out what, what information I want. And you could just take it all, but like I said, you're going to have a huge spreadsheet with a lot of data that you're not really, that just kind of gets in the way. So I typically just, you know, get names and dates uh, on these things. And then we say, create the export. And depending on how much data you're sorting through depends on how long this thing takes to run. Okay. So let's, that, did, that catch that? did it help? I hope yeah. so. I'm not looking at I, the, the question and answer thing tends to distract me. So I'm not looking at it as much. Uh, let me pull that up though, since we are uh, in kind of a waiting area here. Like I said, if you're ever using too big of a data set, like if you're searching for data using the entire state of Texas, it's going to take forever before you get that filtered out because it's going through literally a million or more uh, uh, records. So you can click on this, receive an email with your data. Okay, and then you can just go to bed. You can turn off INAT. I mean, you know, it's you don't have to do anything else. What they'll do is, is their computers will actually send you an email. It might be tomorrow, but it will have that spreadsheet in it that you were asking for. And then you can continue on manipulating your data. Uh, oh, shoot. I really meant to use that smaller data set. Anyway, once we, uh, I'm, I'll talk about it, but once this finishes down here at the bottom of your browser in the lower left-hand corner, there'll be a file downloaded, 
Okay. Just like when you download a picture off Facebook or, or, you know, download a, an article from a news uh, app or something, you know, you'll have a little, little download button here. And when you click on it to open it, it should automatically open that data in whatever your spreadsheet program is. In this case, I'm using Excel. So uh, that's already set as my default. So when I clicked on that particular type file, it opened up inside Excel. And that's where I can actually play around and mess with this. Uh, Abigail too, I'll, I'll offer this, uh, probably won't be able to today, but if you do uh, want a little help with that, I'll try to help you. We could remote in to where I can, you know, I can, you know, help you see your screen, things like that. And I offer that to especially anybody on this meeting. You know, if you want some one-on-one -on -one help with some of this, sometimes it's easier that way. Uh, but always feel free to contact me, shoot me an email, and we'll try to uh, uh, help you, you know, personally, uh, or even if, if there's a big enough need, do another uh another uh, meeting or, or training. I'm going to click receive an email. Okay. And notice they say, and you might not be able to see that, but it says, okay, we'll email you when it's ready. Okay. So I'll just watch my email probably later this evening. Uh, I'll get an email from my naturalist and it should have a link to that data and or the data included in the email. So, uh, Maybe we can go back. Let's use a smaller data set. Let me go back over to uh, uh, Clear Creek. That's a smaller set and things just work better when you're using a smaller set. So there it is, Clear Creek Natural Heritage Area. Go, bam, and say, we got 226 observations. I'm going to do view all. And we're going to go to species, 1107. So I'll print out kind of what we'd call as a life list for Clear Creek rather than one person. So we'll go into filters. Instead of Clear Creek, you could put your name. Okay, that'd be the only thing you change there. If you're going to do a life list for yourself, put in your username. And then we say download it. Now down here is where we change up this query a little bit. Uh, I'm going to take, take off by clicking none. That takes off all the fields. And I'm only going to pick out the fields I want. The date I observed it. And the don't really need my user login because I know those are all, that's in the filter. Uh, geo, I'm going to say none and I'm only going to pick, uh, let's see here, place town and place county and place state. So it's going to have, uh, and then the taxon, I just want scientific name, common name. And that's really all I needed out of that. So I'm gonna do create an export and watch this thing will come back pretty quick because it's a lot fewer things to sort through. And they may be getting busier. Today being a rainy kind of day like here, now it's not everywhere, but when we have you know pretty widespread, not nice weather, more people are using the, the website than they are out in the field taking pictures. <laughs> so if there's a nationwide snow or ice storm, iNaturalist is probably going to be pretty slow because everybody's stuck indoors and they start playing around with their pictures and their data and those type things. So uh, anyway, this is, yeah, it's Saturday afternoon. Uh, people are doing a lot of input. So I'm just going to click on this. <clears throat> but that's the way we would get that list is there again on the search page, we can put in a location or just a particular user. Then we say, let's uh, export this and our filters. You can set in some more filters or less filters. Then you say export and exports where you say exactly what fields you want exported. And it creates that spreadsheet usable file. 
Any questions there? I don't see any in chat. <clears throat> okay. And this the team, don't feel bad if this might be a bit confusing. Uh, it is a little harder because we have a lot of ways or a lot of uh, different ways to do things. So I really today is think of this as you've been exposed to this, you know, there's uh, different ways that I can that I can sift through these millions of observations, uh, you know, quickly, uh, rather than just looking at each one individually. One of the things I did the other day is I said, I wanted to look and find how many different species of dragonflies have been identified in iNaturalist globally. Mm. And man, that was a cool number. I mean, it's like something like 16,000 or not 16,000. It's just an astronomical number of species worldwide. Uh, and, and so the, I, I'd never thought to ask that. And I don't think there's any one book that will tell you that. Uh, but that's the kind of neat stuff that you can pull out of here if you happen to be curious uh, you know, there again, you can filter or you can select just places or people or times, and that makes data a whole lot more uh, usable. Uh, so I was <clears throat> thinking maybe I would make a collection project for mm -hmm. the town of Double Oak, but yeah. instead of being responsible for another project, I could just go in there and get the data to see what all has been observed in the you could. limits of double oak. That's correct. If double yeah. oak has been defined, uh, the boundaries of it, and that's kind of the hard thing. I think on Clear Creek, you know, there's two projects up there. I think I'm the one that actually defined the first boundaries of Clear Creek, and I did it by hand. Someone sent me just a, geog uh, a graphic map, you know, like a trail map, and I sat here and spent all Saturday afternoon drawing by hand the boundaries. And that was before we had these collection uh, ones. And so it's neat that in collections uh, that you don't really have to maintain them. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I mean, it's you create it and it's done. You know, people just have to know they're there to use them or, or look at them. Uh, but that would be really cool to do if you've not done already, especially then you could see what your chapters bio blitz did during the city nature challenge in those those two specific places be really cool i'll help you with that if you need okay if, if you can find a map of some sort you know like uh you know it doesn't have to be like a an aerial map but you know if, if they've got like a trail map or or just a generalized drawing of a of the map I, i'll try to help you with that if you need. okay yeah so any other mm -hmm. questions so far on what Michael's covered? No? Okay. Go ahead, Michael. All right. Well, uh, I'm kind of getting down there to the point where I've run out of things to really talk about. But, you know, it's mainly just, you know, a lot of people put stuff in and they go look at, you know, their own stuff or they look at a particular uh project uh but when you get something like Louisville here uh let's see if we get into the map mm. you can see how the city of Louisville we have so many observations that that's not very useful to try to sort through that number of observations to find out about one specific species or you know one particular person identifying things uh, so that's where these filterings really become important to narrow down your search. Instead of looking at the forest, you get to start staring at the trees, okay? And that's when you start to learn some, some things. So there again is you can find a, you know, narrow your searches down to a place or a particular type species, uh, like I could say dragonflies and I could say, uh, <clears throat> say Clear Creek, okay? Then we go to filters and then we start, you know, we can either, you know, further narrow that search 
or uh, and then we do this download button and that's where we say okay out of the stuff i've narrowed it down to here's here's the fields that i want to have okay yeah. so that that's you know it, it just takes it doing it a time or two and your first time probably going to be a little uh you know confusing but once you've done this two or three times, it, it, uh, it starts to make more sense and you can fly through this a little bit faster every time. Uh, there again, I like using this for those uh, species lists, uh, especially for Leela. You know, we used to guess, uh, like before INAT, uh, they called in, you know, a bird expert. And he says, well, here's the birds that you should be able to see at Leela. Well, you know, that's fine but being should be able to see something and actually seeing something are two different things so now all the lists are based on things that we have actually had people see at leela uh no guessing they're here we you know you can see them so uh anyway that's that pretty much concludes unless anybody has any other questions or or ideas or anything uh i'm always open to discussion there Okay, so Abigail asked, if you just put in double oak, will you get all the observations with double oak in the location? Yeah, it, it depends. Uh, you know, certain areas are really well defined, like Denton County. If I go in there and put in Denton County, that's defined. I mean, that's very defined. There's, there's plenty of you know, places where you find those boundaries. And it will show you all the stuff from Denton County. Or if I say city of Louisville, you know, that's a very well-defined, you know, uh, uh, city or government. Uh, and it will find stuff just in that city. Now, smaller places like Leela or like Double Oak, uh, you probably are going to have to go in here and there's a way that you can actually draw the boundaries of that smaller location okay. okay so double o probably won't now big state parks are really well defined like say if you went to benson rio grande state park that is well defined and, and you could say show me all this kind of bird at benson rio grande it, it will filter it down because it's a very uh, well established boundaries uh, but smaller places and parks like say Central Park in Louisville, that's not defined, okay? So I probably wouldn't. Okay. I hope that makes sense. National parks are well-defined too. If you said, show me all the buffalo in Yellowstone National Park, it'll show you all the buffalo in Yellowstone National Park because those boundaries are exceptionally well-defined uh, okay. data-wise. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So does anyone else have any other questions? Y'all got it all down, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, team, this is the, really the first time I've done a presentation on this. So sorry if it was probably not as good as some of the presentations I've done in the past, but uh, I appreciate you letting me take this opportunity to talk about it. And uh, if we do another one, hopefully I'll just get better, better at this. As we go. It's a, it's a little tougher subject. Yeah. Okay. So Betty has a question for you. Betty. Moore. Okay. Yeah, Betty. Hey, you, you mean all the buffalo or bison that have uh -huh. been observed in Yellowstone National Park? Not all the buffalo in national park in the national park. Well, it would be all the buffalo that someone has uploaded their observation into iNaturalist. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. All right. So, so if no would... one ever uploads a picture, we don't have much of a program here. So that's why it's always so important to try to get more and more people to put more and more of their observations. That gives us better and better data to go on. Right, but and and you could your your observation could be the same animal seen uh -huh. by multiple people. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's got really not it, it's not a it's not an estimate of the population of wildlife in any area. It's the 
number of times that species has been physically observed. That's correct. That is okay. correct. That's a, there's a big difference there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. There certainly is. And it also helps you with, you know, and then there's, you know, and this all comes with how do I analyze the data sitting here in front of me? Yeah. Uh, you know, and it, it's not like we're bird banding where each bird has a unique number that we've put on that bird specifically. Uh, but it does show like re regions or, or the, uh, the range uh, right. for, yes one yeah cool, yeah one of the oh cool, yeah it's lots of lots of good data but i just wanted to yeah. clarify that yeah. sure i'm glad you did and that's why we count on you guys because y'all are trained probably more detailed than what i am even but uh well, and one, if you're working on a master's degree it needs to be yes it <laughs> certainly does and and they do need to look at this data uh, you know with the correct eye which there have been some really nice scientific studies published uh, that have relied on data, but it's not been, you know, they don't try to turn the data into something that it's really not. Uh, like ranges, what sure. I first found out here is when you look at National Geographic's birds of North America and you say, okay, let me look at a tricolored heron, you know, they have the range maps. Uh -huh. In their range map, a tricolored heron is nowhere to be found other than the Gulf Coast of the United States. Now, I have photographs in INAT, plenty of them, of tricolored herons at Southwest Medical Center's rookery here in Dallas-Fort Worth. Yeah, well, they, they don't consider hurricanes and strong winds, do they? <laughs> <laughs> so those birds, you know, and, and they change. Uh, one of the big things mm. that, that's been found out yeah. is yeah. porcupines. Porcupines used to never be in Central Texas. I mean, in just in the last 20 years, they have a a really big population of porcupines from the West. Uh, Greg Lassley was, uh, did some of the first identifications and then, uh, you know, the U <coughs> University of Texas, Austin got involved in researching that. And yeah, so now in the books, any new books that are coming out in the last 10 or so years have the range of a porcupine all the way down into the hill country of Texas, which had never been, you know, that, that just didn't happen. 20 years ago. They, they yeah. were nowhere near. So all our populations are changing. And this sometimes helps give uh, scientists, you know, maybe not the nitty gritty detail, but it gives them the detail of where I might start looking, <laughs> you know, like, oh, wait, man, they're starting to see this species down here in this area, uh, which is really kind of cool. Okay, well, thank you, Michael. We enjoyed All right. It. Well, I appreciate all the work you folks do. Y'all, you know, it's an admirable uh, thing that you do. And, and I especially appreciate all the work and volunteerism you do. And I appreciate you letting me speak to you today. Okay. All right. So I wanted to remind everybody of the City Nature Challenge. Um, it's April 30th to May 3rd. And make sure you go in and join the City Nature Challenge, which is worldwide. And then also join the Dallas Fort Worth. Um, that's the part of the nature challenge that um, Elmport chapter counties, the three counties, will be included in. Um, and then we're going to have a bio blitz at Pratt Nature Preserve in Hickory Creek on April 30th, that Friday at um, 9 a.m. And then we're also going to have one at Green Acres, um, same day, April 30th at 1 p.m. They can have up to 20 um, Elmport chapter members. You do need to RSVP so that 21 people want to come and we need to tell them that they'll have to come back another day. So um, if you guys will do that, uh, Becky is the RSVP for Green Acres. And Dinah Stoltz is the RSVP for the Pratt Nature Preserve. So get signed up today. Um, I think that was it. And if anybody wants to, I haven't heard from anybody to volunteer to go and look at Abigail's books and pick out about a dozen that um, we'd like to have at our resource room, um, the Elmfort Chapter Library. So. Anybody wants to do that, just let me know. But sign up with Becky for Green Acres and Dinah for Pratt. And let's kick some butt. <laughs> <It's a sitting laughs> 
So thank you, everybody. That's the end of the meeting. Unless somebody has a question. Well, thank you and goodbye. Uh, I'll take care. Thank you. Got to got to beat South Africa this year. I tell you what, they blew the entire world off the map last year. Yeah. I was just really shocked at that. They did. And they're yeah. tiny, aren't they? <laughs> well, you know, they have one of the, well, I believe it is the largest nature preserve in the world is that Kruger National Park. Uh -huh. I think that thing runs into five different countries of South Africa. Oh, okay. South Africa. I mean, it's like, Huge. Yeah. oh, monstrous, monstrous. And I think that's where a lot.